Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's start. It's about 15. Good afternoon. Hi. How are you? I'm Rob Weiner Kent. I'm senior editor of the Metal Theater Magazine. A couple weeks that that will change, but for now, I'm going to talk to uh, our editor in chief, Jim O'Quinn, who's who retired. Uh, You were hired in 1982, is that right? By yeah, in 1982, to, uh, to edit a newsletter. Is that, is that fair? Well, and to create the new... So they already had the idea to create the magazine. They heard the, the idea story. was there. Yeah. yeah. Um, the idea for the magazine belonged to Peter Zeisler and uh, Lindy Zesch, the Zs, as they were quite the Zs, known. Yeah. And uh, we got some Zs here with us today, too. <laughs> uh, and uh, they needed a, a person who uh, was uh, conversant with the theater, but was also a journalist right, right. in order to, um, you know, to, to spend a couple of years developing the, the magazine idea. Right. Um, and that was, that was head you. by so name all over it. Now, I, you, I remember some, some of your history. You came to New York in the late 70s to study performance. Is that right? Do I have that right? Ah, uh, that's right. Where? Performance studies. Uh, I, we're going to talk about me. I, I think you should have. I think you should have introduced me, and I should have come down the stairs <laughs> like Norma Desmond in, uh, in that movie. But uh, no, I was. Uh, I started out as a, I have a. Deg I have degrees in journalism and English. I started out as a city desk reporter on the Times Picayune in New Orleans. Uh, eventually, ran a weekly newspaper in Southwest Louisiana that won. Uh, was a sort of a nightmarish experience, but we won six Louisiana Press Association awards and sold the paper for profit. Thank you. And uh, and I also worked in the theater community uh, in New Orleans, including being an apprentice actor in the professional uh, repertory theater of New Orleans, the worst actor ever made. Uh, but I did uh, uh, spend some time. time. I did my time as a time professional there. actor. But uh, anyway. I, uh, the theater in New Orleans um, uh, sagged in the 70s, okay. and toward the end of the 70s, uh, my, my, my daughter was moving up east, I moved up east, I went to the performance studies department to sort of legitimize my interest in the theater, and TCG hired me out of, I spent three and a half years in performance studies, yeah. um, but they hired me out of that department to create American theater. Right. Now we've tried to... There was no since the demise of theater magazine, which was in the 60s. Well, amazingly yeah. enough, for 20 yeah. years before Amer uh, American theater was established, before yeah. the first issue in April 84, there was no national theater magazine about the theater in America. Right, right. That had ended in 64 with the demise of the old theater arts. Theater arts, okay. Theater arts was around all the way from 1915, I believe, from the teens right up through 64, but Theater Arts had always been a magazine about New York, really. Uh, in those last years, Theater Arts carried columns like, you know, labeled, uh, you know, Hartford or labeled Phoenix, but they were many reports uh, from, and, and basically the magazine was still New York centric. From the, the region. From, yeah. from the regions, that sort of thing, yeah. and uh, it didn't really wash, and the magazine uh, folded, so. While there were magazines about opera and dance and other art, symphony and art, other art forms in America, the, there was no theater magazine. And Peter uh, knew that that was not a good thing. And uh, and uh, Peter and Lindy had uh, had in mind uh, who better to uh, to sponsor a magazine about America's theater than the service organization for the new national theater that had come about. In Years. And yeah, exactly, pretty much exactly from the death of theater arts, the, the mid-60s. That's right. When the, the, the resident theater movement boomed, and by the time you came on board, it was, it was going full steam, right? Pretty much, yeah. 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 I mean, there were was, there was still some companies that were formed in the 80s, but a lot of the ones that we, that we talked about now, the Guthrie and so on, founded about 50 years ago. That's right. That's right. But there was no magazine nationally to cover them. What, what, was, what was the mandate they gave you uh, and the rope they gave you to... to, to, to well, uh, because our publisher is a service organization for the theater, uh, it's, it's a little journalistically iffy, uh, full-fledged independent commentary 
is, was, and is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we're, uh, in a certain way, since the TCG is a membership organization, the theaters that we're covering yeah. pay our salaries to some degree. Right. Right. So uh, it's, it's challenging to, but, but Peter and Lindy were adamant about uh, uh, at least a reasonable measure of journalistic independence and a, uh, and a mandate to deal with the problems, difficulties, and challenges of the theater that existed. And, uh, you know, you, you can go thumbs up or thumbs down on how well we've done that right. over the years, right. but uh, God knows we've tried, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. What, what, what um, so there really, there were no other national magazines, but even the state of publishing in general was, was more robust than it is now, would you say? Our, our oh. Arts journalism, uh, daily papers. Well. Uh, Around the country, but not only, not only New York. Yeah, there were there were uh, there was there were still arts reporters on uh, daily papers everywhere, and theater critics who actually got paid for writing regularly. Right. And uh, that, that that's uh, just not the case right. anymore in, in any great numbers. So now we published something online just just uh, today, which was a sort of your nutshell history of the regional theater, and it talked a lot about. The movement that Zeisler and TCG and others led, uh, not not solely, but helped helped to lead and to, to to support, which made I think in your phrase uh, the theater not used to be centrifugal, all coming toward New York, you know. For, well, I mean, it I'm used sorry, to spin spin it's way, centrifugal. It spun out of New York, York, and then now uh, there were road companies and yeah. Shakespeare tours and big Broadway hits went on the road and so forth. But right, right, right. Uh, the truth is that. Yeah, it used to come out from New York as well. So yeah. Had it backwards, yeah, and that dates all the way, all the way back to the beginning of the country. You know, uh, Shakespeare on the road. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. to yeah. frontier towns yeah. and so forth. Um, but uh, now, it, it, it seriously has changed, as you see from just look down your New York Times listings. You yeah. know, the yeah. most important works from uh, on Broadway, musical or uh, plays, have been have begun and originated elsewhere and come profits. to New York in yeah. nonprofit companies yeah. for the most part. Yeah, a large percentage. Large yeah. percentage. Um, so you picked up this movement midstream. I'm wondering what you feel like in the 80s, what the biggest changes you've seen in the, in the resident theater movement in the three decades? Hmm, I think it's changes. I don't know. Uh, that's, uh, that's really hard to say. I, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in international work, right, and right. I think uh, during the late 80s and early 90s, before sort of the xenophobia of the Bush era began, we had lots of uh, exciting international influence. I'm proud of the way that the uh, American theater introduced artists like Arian Manushkin from France, and uh, uh, Tadashi Suzuki from Japan, and uh, Pina Bausch, right? Pina Bausch. Uh, uh, Robert Lepage, yeah. uh, all sorts of international artists. We wrote about before they had actually even performed in the United States. So we introduced those those important world artists to to America before right. uh, before audiences had a chance. That's I, I, one thing. American theater is often the first uh, major or national publication to write about a lot, of, not just international artists, but 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 American artists as well. Um, yeah. It's true. They, we, we, in fact, that 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 could well be seen as a fault of ours that we're always searching for the for the new, yeah, untried, yeah. tested, uh, sort of hot new, uh, you know, new face, yeah. as opposed to covering people who've had long, distinguished careers in in the theater. We're trying to uh, to uh, repair that that balance uh, a, a little bit from time to time. We just did. A, Really terrific Q and A with Rock Schulfer for his many years at the Goodman. Uh, in this upcoming issue, uh, Emily Mann will be on the cover of a wonderful piece by Alexis Green on the quiet radicalism of Emily Mann. Look at the McCarter uh, yeah. yeah. and so forth. Um, you know, we need to strike a balance between new faces and uh, well deserved credit for well deserved accomplishments. Well, I think it is easy to take it's easy to take for granted the institutions that we came up with, I mean, um, yeah. that, that were there and just always seemed to have been the big theater on the hill. What was interesting about the Rock Chauffeur is that the Goodman Theater was never a storefront theater. 
but it, it was on the ropes many times, and it, the, the big success that we see in it now was, was hard fought and, and continues to be fought, yeah, so yeah. Uh, we do try to cover the, Those stories you forget, yeah. and, and so yeah. it's really good to, to know that. Um, I think there's a, there's a possibility that maybe American theater itself and arts journalism is taken for granted. I wonder, uh, we've, we've moved into the internet a lot more. Uh, we have, you know, completely. Uh, uh, we're a daily now, not just Well, yeah, even more than daily, so. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're hourly, dude, almost. Um, that's obviously not something that you have been a part of, but it's been sort of a long time coming, right? You know? Well, it, it's, it was an absolute necessity, yeah. uh, given the, the situation of journalism in America, and um, I, I, you know, I think I credit Teresa a lot, Teresa Iring, our director at TCG, for uh, understanding this and plowing ahead, and uh, I mean, we we went online with virtually no additional budget, yeah. no additional staff. Yeah. We just did it, yeah. and we did it beautifully. Thanks in no small part to Susie Evans and Deep Tran, who are yeah. sitting right here with us. Yeah. Uh, you know, just incredible uh, skills and, and, and gifts that, that that took us there, and. Uh, it's, I'm, I couldn't be more delighted that I'm leaving the magazine in this in this double uh, identity here with the online and the paper. So, yeah, I, I do want to ask a. I'm going to turn up the questions in a second, but uh, uh, if you could talk about what maybe your, your proudest accomplishment so you know, in, the, in the time that you've been at uh, the magazine. Well, you know, I'm I'm a journalist, and I'm proudest. I guess almost of just individual stories yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that we've run. Some of them, you know, really unforgettable things that, uh, you know, things I love that we've published. Um, our, our first big piece on Cornerstone Theater, when yeah. Robert Coe wrote about that, that we, we did the cover story of uh, the Port Gibson interracial Romeo and Juliet, remember that? Yeah. Just an incredible, Reportage, and it led to years of coverage of Cornerstone, Bill Roush, uh, that whole, that whole epic. I loved uh, Don Shuey, the great Don Shuey. Uh, his piece, uh, what's it called? The Actor is Object of Desire, sort of the erotics of acting. Great, a great piece. It's in, it's in this book. In yeah, I should mention we're going to we'll be signing copies of this at the end of the uh, end of our time here. Um, I loved uh, the work Todd London and I uh, did together. Todd did a whole series of pop culture, uh, sort of pop culture responses to the theater uh, that were great pieces. They're now published in one of his books of essays. Um, so, you know, I think those are my proudest things when we come up with, you know, something wonderful that, yeah. that uh, really makes a difference. Well, Todd, it's interesting. Todd, Todd uh, has covered, we're going to print the story in September, the last issue that you'll be Yeah, that's, on. that's a nice, that's a nice uh, fortuitous uh, uh, happening. Uh, 20 years ago, Todd wrote a piece about the uh, 15 graduating seniors at the ART School of Acting at, right. at Harvard and uh, followed them for a year after their graduation about how it was to leave school and go out into the acting world. And uh, it was a three-part series uh, examining their, their lives and their studies. Now, 20 years later, he's going to follow up on these actors' lives, and that's going to be in the September issue of the magazine. We're going to get not just their venturing into the world, but the life they've lived in the 20 years. So how many of them are still actors? How many of them are famous? How many of them are uh, starving on, you know, uh, on a doorstep somewhere? We'll, we'll see, but it's going to be a fascinating uh, <laughs> There's one of my favorite writers. Roger Copeland. You might remember him from our recent uh, Chekhov uh, essay about Chekhov, our contemporary. Uh, just his latest contribution to the magazine. There's another one. There's uh, uh, there's our great architectural architectural writer who uh, wrote about uh, stages, uh, the best stages in the world and the not so best ones. Uh, 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 a rant against the black box was, was great. That, that was a great piece. So you know. It's Joshua Dax, by the way. Joshua Dax, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, 
So anyway, I, I, I love particular pieces uh, the best. This is so. more like a piece of, uh, we're just having an editorial meeting here for you all. Uh, advice, it, it, and we've talked about it before, and it's what we, we talk about every day. We're, we're a small office based in New York, about five editors, and freelancers all over the place. But how have you managed to cover the national, the Ameri and not just the, the international scene as well, from one desk in New York? Informants is the main, informants <laughs> yeah. is the main. It's the main thing. Well, TCG is an enormous uh, hotbed of information, yeah. uh, a clearinghouse of information. A everything that happens in the theater, the word passes through there, so we have a chance to watch for it and look for it. Uh, but uh, we, we, we have a network of people that we talk to, uh, critics, writers, uh, academics, and theater people around the, around the country that we try to stay in touch with. Sometimes we programmatically do that. We make lists of people that we want to call and, and talk to, or at other times it's uh, more laissez-faire. But, uh, but that's really, really important is to hear what's happening uh, in, in, in local places from yeah. local people. Right. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I'd open the floor if anyone has any questions for Jim about the Legacy or for Rob, who, yeah. who, as you know, will be uh, assuming the editorship of the magazine uh, this coming. But well, you've, you've sort of first, yeah. July first is the yeah. official day, yeah. So. But there'll be a transitional period where there'll be two. We're going to we're going to work together just as we have for the past six years. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I would have to say I could not be more pleased. I think I've never worked with a finer journalist than oh. than Rob, and uh, it's. It, it bodes really well for the future of the magazine. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, with that, anyone have any questions about the legacy of the magazine? I've got more I can ask them, but if you all... Yes? Um, I noticed that TCG has a program for kind of global cooperation. American theater artists can go abroad and do yeah. projects. Do you write up in the afterwards what happens in those projects? Or is that something you might Well, and once again, it's that's... Part of the uh, part of the touchy area, how much of TCG's own programming are we going to write about in the magazine? We we pretty studiously avoid doing some sort of big feature on what our own publisher, uh, our own publisher's initiatives in the theater. We sort of leave that to 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 other folks, but we do have our page of one page of TCG news, and we. Uh, and we, we cover those things in the context. Perhaps something comes of that that's a wonderful project, you see, that, that, that is presented somewhere. We'll cover that as a, a, you know, as a production or something like that. We, we, we try to cleverly avoid uh, 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 broadcasting TCG's efforts as such. As such. I, I, would, I would just only add to that that I think there are cases where the folks that TCG is supporting and the projects they're supporting are good stories in themselves. What we're not going to write about is, isn't it great that TCG did this grant program? But we might, on a case-by-case -case basis, say, that grantee, that's a story, we want to hear more about their story. But we're just not going to highlight. We definitely do mention if they have a TCG AHA grant or a, or a one of those. But, it, but again, the perception, we don't want to, we want to go against the perception that we're the TCG newsletter or house organ. Uh, you know, because we cover we cover a lot of theaters that aren't members. We cover a lot of theater activity that's not, and we and we and we have we're international in scope. The uh, yeah. the the internationalism I was talking about before in the '80s and '90s was was really uh, simply due to the fact that these things were really happening and, yeah. and influencing the American theater. Today, the International Theater Institute New York is centered in the TCG offices with Emilio Capuchero as our head and. Uh, Internationalism has become part of the magazine's uh, mandate, right. and we have a global spotlight column every month. We have an international issue in uh, May June that uh, focuses on some parts of the different parts of the world. Uh, we we publish the biggest uh, 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 compendium of uh, international festival information that anybody does, I believe. So internationalism is a big part of our mandate. Yeah, what's interesting is we, we used to do sort of an obligatory section called Global Spotlight, where we just would, obligatory, we did a good job of it, but it was basically like each month we would talk about whatever festivals were happening. 
I, I never felt, I felt writing about a festival that's happening in Europe this month is not gonna help anyone here plan to go there, right? They could find out about the work. So we decided to just do a column and make it a column about anything happening globally. And we thought, rather than making a slot for it and, and just you know, <coughs> plugging a story into it, and we were worried that there wouldn't be enough stories coming our way, the way that the stories come to us. No we, we have an overflow <laughs> of ideas of someone yeah. doing exchange, someone taking their play to Armenia. Uh, it just, there's mm -hmm. so much happening. Jerry, you had a question. I, um, I don't know if you can answer it. Uh, what is your frank appraisal of the future of the print magazine? You know, we've seen Newsweek go away. Right, right, like right. Every, I mean, the magazine industry is going. <laughs> Yet, the print issue is sort of our record yeah. of, of what occurs, of what has occurred. Right, right. What, what do you, where do you see it going? I bet you can't answer, but I'd, no, love, we to can't. <laughs> I'd love to hear no. your, your read on it as best you can give it. Well, you know, uh, it's just as up in the air for us as it is for <laughs> the New York Times or yeah, any, yeah. anybody else. It's, one thing that we're... You know, we started, we went online last October. We've been online since then. At some point soon, we're going to, uh, we or uh, my successors, are going to sit down and evaluate exactly what the impact uh, has been for, for say, a year right. of online yeah. in tandem with the print issue. And decisions are going to be made. Will the magazine become, you know, uh, bi monthly? Uh, in print, uh, six times a year instead of ten. Will it, uh, you know, will it simply shrink and more uh, to to lower its expenses and so on? We, you know, we're a trade publication, and as such, our advertising has been more robust than you might imagine. Uh, it, it it hasn't shrunk. Uh, you know, the theater uh, training institutions and so forth. We're the, we're the only game in town, and uh, that advertising has, has, has I'm not saying it has, the, the totals haven't gone down like everybody else's have, but, but we're, we're not sever as severely damaged by uh, this, this anti-print trend uh, as, as some others have been. Uh, the magazine, amazingly enough, it doesn't, we're, we're subsidized by TCG, but not by a hell of a lot. So mm -hmm. it's really, uh, we're really proud of that, of that record. And it still stands at the moment. But things, as you know, are changing rapidly and we just don't know which one before. Yeah, well, do, I, was, I would just say, doing both of them, the web and print, has made me think a lot about this, especially as we move to this transition. And I do feel like being on the web, you get sort of get into the rapids of a river and you don't have a chance to step back and look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm starting to think of the print issues while we still do them, and I think for the foreseeable future we're gonna do 10 issues a year as ways to organize our thinking around topics and timely issues so that we can stop, step aside and say, here's gonna be our issue on this. And if, well, this big, I keep making this like a tent, like a tent of stories. This is where we're gonna put these stories. Now, some of them are actually gonna be, only go online because we just have more ideas about this than we could. But that, that issue that comes out of September is gonna be our marker. And then also the, the print issue, the print edition will have a nice uh, uh, package of stories about that, about that, whatever that is. So hopefully we'll also have timely information you wanna get up. I don't wanna become the magazine like the New Yorker just gets stacked up. I mean, people read the New Yorker too, but you know, it becomes a pile. Like, I want to get to that one day. We want to be the magazine people want to, that they really want to read. So, we're we're gonna and we also, we want to hear from people at this conference what you would like to see in the magazine. What would you like to see in print and online, and how do you get your information? I've there, so many people I've met and said, do you have a website? Like, they don't even know that we have a website. So we need to we need to let them know. Jenny. My favorite. Conversations or responses to articles in the magazine that have surprised you? Have surprised us? Yeah. <coughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. the, bi the biggest responses have come, you know, they're, they're moments that you know of, the, you know, the famous August Wilson Ground on which I stand speech, which was delivered at the 
86, no, 90, 90, 96, 96 TCG first. conference in, uh, in, at Princeton, and we printed it immediately, and Mr. Brewstein uh, did his rebuttals to it in the magazine, <laughs> magazine and then those two uh, important gentlemen ended up facing off at New York's town hall one Christmas, arguing about it, sponsored by American Theater. I mean, that was quite the hullabaloo. And that transcript's uh, never been made available, right? That, that, that there, neither neither of the gentlemen wanted that transcript made available. It's never been. But that became a national story. That wasn't. That That's was a national story. story. Times. That was. Uh, um, uh, you know that I was just interrupt you to say that the, the, the 20th anniversary of that speech is coming up, and we're going to do something big about that because I think there's a generation of people who don't even know what that right. August Wilson speech was about, what he was saying, what has happened to culture specific theater since then. It's, you know, it's obviously issues that we're all talking about all the time, but that speech was a marker that we want to. You never know what, uh, many times you don't know what, what is going to get a, uh, uh, an enormous response. We ran a, a rather uh, insipid story one time about the Spanish Golden Age, Lope de Vega and playwrights like that, and I got 20 letters and, uh, uh, you know, a huge response. But why? There's a, is there a secret Golden Age society out there? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, often you do not know uh, what, what will. And, and we publish things that we think are going to just infuriate oh, just, people, yeah, it's like, oh. and it's silence. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have no idea. So. We just had a story about uh, just the theater in Egypt that we published. Uh, and I think someone must have assigned it to a class or something, because there were a, a ton of online comments about it, uh -huh. saying this is a great story. And they almost had the same wording, like, this is a great story about Egyptian theater. I did not know all this. <laughs> and, you know, you never know. Online comments have actually been more robust, I'll just say. Uh, than I would have thought. I didn't think people used online comment sections anymore, but they, they really people want to talk. Any questions anybody's got? Jim or I? Yes. So what's a favorable trend you've been watching in the theater movement over the last few years? And would either of you like dream for me for a minute? I'm not asking you to predict, just to hope like a headline that that trend might lead to a few years from now. I love the developments in chamber musicals. I think small chamber musicals uh, are really carrying the weight of the future of the musical rather than the big uh, overblown music. I love uh, the work of, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, can you name Michael Solis? Well, Michael John tends to do the big stuff, but uh, um, uh, Dave Malloy. No. Dave Malloy is, is, is not. That's not exactly a chamber musical. I'm thinking of the of the, uh, <laughs> the February House at the Public oh, Theater. Right, yeah. You know, uh, work work like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so that's that that, that Gabriel, makes me happy no, because Kahane. Like, Gabriel Kahane, Kahane, Kahane uh, people like that. Kahane. Kahane. Uh, what do you think? I mean, fun, home, fun Home is a chamber. Fun, fun Home is yeah. a chamber. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, I was going to say something else. Now you musicals. That's a big, the big Oh, well, that's Rob's. Topic for my, well, Rob's. that's one of my topics. Well, I, I, I mean, the thing we're watching, you know, is, is this discussion about diversity and inclusion, and specifically gender parity is one that we've watched. And I will say that I'm actually... What, what I'm hopeful about is that we need to dig into the numbers. That those top, the top ten lists we do every year of... One of the top ten plays. Notoriously, there's a very few uh, female playwrights there. But if you dig down below the numbers and you also look at generationally of who, not just living playwrights versus dead ones, but old versus you know playwrights under 40, under 50. We don't have the numbers yet, but I see a trend that is much. I mean, I've had I've had friends of mine say like. It looks like there's more women. You know, it's like there's it's it's swung away in the other direction. Well, I think that's actually a favorable trend. So, I we don't have those headlines yet, but I think that the trend toward toward more and there's, this coming season, there's more theaters announcing all female or female dominated seasons. I mean, it's just it's 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 a redress that's like overdue, and I, I think it's a trend that you know we're we're it's an ongoing coverage. So maybe more than one headline on that one. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys talk about the, the, the plague? I mean, you know, putting the plays in the magazine and just oh. sort of the history of that. Yeah, totally. yeah. Uh, well, we, we didn't at the very first, but it was only, Terry, how long was it before we started putting plays in the magazine? Uh, 
Justice Something Act. like that. Execution, Execution of Justice, Justice was yeah. the first play we, we uh, by Emily Mann, was the first play we published. So if that was 88, it took us four years. We got uh, uh, a grant from, do you remember? Uh, we got we got we got a, a lovely grant from someone <laughs> to to huh? Ask K was it? Thank you, dear. Jenny was there too. Yes, and, uh, and it was the Skirball Foundation, and we uh, that that lasted maybe ten years, uh, and then we just kept putting the plays in uh, for free. We started with I think four four or five, but now we publish five a year. I believe that's five or six. Five. Five. Five, five, five plays, five plays a year yeah. on our own dime. And uh, I know. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know that very well. And our, uh, our committee of uh, in house committee reads these plays and selects them. They're not uh, submitted for uh, potential publication. We scout them out and uh, seek. And, they're, and uh, it's, a, it's a balance. As you know, uh, Terry and our publications program publishes a great many plays in uh, single editions and multiple volumes. Uh, and so there's always a, 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 a tug of war about uh, what might be right just for the magazine or for the magazine and in an anthology or et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is all part of the discussion. Yeah, I will say also to answer your Jerry, question, Jerry, a little bit is the one thing that's only in the magazine and for the foreseeable future will only be in print is the plays. Those are not online. They won't be online anytime soon. And so yeah. if you want to read the five plays we get a year, it's only, only in print. We do extensive interviews with the playwrights, and, and that goes on. Yeah, we didn't. That's another interesting point. We didn't do that for a while. We just published the play. And then I kept getting letters from this lady in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and she would say, oh, she, wrote, she must have written to me four times. You know? What was that play you put in that night? I didn't understand a word of it. Could you explain <laughs> this? So uh, we realized that we needed more than just a play text, especially if it was a, an adventurous or bewildering play. And uh, we began putting nice two-page two spread interviews with the playwright to help the lady in Pennsylvania understand <laughs> what these plays were. It wasn't in Central Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it's, that's been a, a, a wonderful addition to the magazine that our readers have, mm -hmm. have helped us with. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got questions for Jim? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, what advice would you give to like, aspiring journalists or playwrights? Two different questions. Go into yeah. computers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we have lots of aspiring journalists pass through our we have a busy and uh, productive internship program. It's a, it, you know, become an AT intern, become a TCG intern. As I said, it's a clearinghouse of information. You can learn an amazing amount. And our internships, uh, well, you know, Susie, the managing editor, Susie Evans, the managing editor of the magazine, was an intern who helped uh, in, in her uh, internship. She helped develop this this fat book here. Uh, uh, I don't know, Stephanie Cohen, were you ever an intern? Or were you just, no, you just were hired, okay. Uh, but but uh, internships are very productive and interesting there, and we, we incorporate our interns completely into the editorial process. It's, it's a terrific thing. But the, we're, we're five people. We're not, we don't provide lots of opportunities for real employment um, and it's just getting tougher and tougher out there yeah. uh, you know have an online presence write write a blog um, do the things that your journalism teacher suggests <laughs> yeah I will say I, I left uh, I was editor of backstage West till 2003. I moved to New York in 2005. It took me 10 years. Like, I got the job at, TCG, uh, at American Theater in 2009, but these positions like gyms don't open up very often. Um, well, I've been at it for 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 so, you know, just wait around until you're 60, 70. Yeah, you, you've got a shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will say, uh, anecdotally, this is probably, uh, I used to, when I was at Backstage West, 
uh, I would I felt guilty that I had a job with health insurance and that many of the people I was covering, you know, were struggling to make ends meet and didn't have, and especially now they don't make any money doing theater. Um, I felt guilty about it. And then I, I'm not saying the shoes on the other foot. I know there's huge compensation issues in the American theater and huge equity issues and access. But I gotta say, I'm not, I am less concerned about the future of the American theater. I feel like it's gonna be fine, it's gonna exist, than I am about journalism. Absolutely. I, I, feel like, I feel like when you say playwright versus journalist, there's no huge commission for journalists. You know? There's no Edgerton Prize for journalists. There's no, you know, it's, it's, it's a really tough field. I, I'm really interested in, uh, we've had partnerships with the Jerome Foundation, with the Irvine Foundation, the, Irvine Foundation, each, uh, uh, the Hewlett yeah. Foundation, to fund uh, journalists in certain regions or with certain mandates. Uh, I been, like that's been a terrific program. The Jerome Foundation funded us for 19 years. Yeah. We put, we did um, almost 60 young journalists, including such people as Jesse McKinley, who's for the New York Times, yeah. uh, 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 David Ng, who's on the Los Angeles Times. Yeah, a lot of good people come from that. Terrific uh, journalists. That's that's a great program, but. That no longer exists. Well, I would uh, like to. I mean, that's one of the things I, I want to do. We, we want to do it. Here is to encourage TCG to help us develop new journalists, new journalists of color, because it's a really white field, new journalists in other regions, because it's a very New York and LA based. So I think we can play a role uh, in helping to nurture the next generation, because it's. I think it's theater can exist without journalism, right? It can. But I don't want to live in a world where we don't talk about it, we don't print, you know, cover it, and it's not, it's not marked, especially theater, because it's 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 something that's, that's well, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm fond of saying that <coughs> theater is a uh, is one of the few places that you can still bring people to church, maybe you bring people together to dis, to to experience something together, and it's a dialogue of ideas and and and. Uh, uh, it, it's meant to, to promote discussion and thought. And if the discussion and thought that follows it doesn't exist, or if it's inferior, or if it's weak, yeah. then the theater is weakened. You know, yeah, the yeah. dialogue that follows the act of theater is an essential part of the theatrical act. And that's what American theater is, one of the things American theater has devoted itself to, is to being that, providing a place for that dialogue to happen so that the theatrical act is completed and rounded and, 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 uh, and made fuller. So. We want there to be more, more of, of us and you, so we're going to work on that. Are there, are there folks here? Right. Yeah. yeah, and it's sort of a follow-up to the how to get started question a minute ago. Does it still make sense for an aspiring writer to offer to do a piece on spec? I don't know if that phrase even still exists. I mean, I remember 40 years ago, I would write to editors and I would say, you know, I've got this idea for a piece and they would sometimes say, do it on spec, meaning on speculation. We have no obligation to pay you or to publish it, but we'll give it a quick and sympathetic reading when it comes in. Does that still happen? It happens. <laughs> it happens rarely. There, it's very seldom that we accept over the transit pieces mm -hmm. uh, that just come right. come to right, us right, right. because we're we're, we're busy, uh, you know, planning an, an agenda. But um, but there are occasions like that. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be some middle ground between your formally commissioning a piece and signing yeah. a contract and all that, and saying, yeah, that sounds like a a great idea. Give it a, give it a try. So, Roger, what I would say is that in my experience on the other side, pitching and freelancing, and also being on both sides of it a lot, that that if, if, in the conversations you have, either conversations on the phone or email or in pitches, if you're able to convey in that pitch what your take is and what and what an interesting thinker you are. That's usually enough. If, I mean, pitches can tell us a lot. I mean, we also want to see great writing from other samples of writing. But we don't tend to, unless someone's a fully formed writer and or someone we know, 
like a, a, maybe a name person, Tony Kushner sent us something tomorrow that's fully, we, we might just, you know, sure. make a few, duh, change a few comments. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, and you know, yeah, so it, it's, it's rare. But you know, I would say it's no more rare, Jim, than just finding a good writer who could write anything, you know. So yeah. it, sometimes it's spec, sometimes sure. it's a pitch, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah I think a, a writer who's particularly focused on on uh, theater and theater arts. You know, if you don't pitch to American theater and dramatics and Yale theater and just a handful of places, what do you do? That, that's, that's it. So, yeah. Susan, to add to that response, oh, yeah. about spec versus pitch. Rob says really true. If someone emails us and says they have some really interesting idea for a story or and they show it, like Rob said, their pitch that they're really interested in. We will assign a commission to write that. We would never say, like, go forth and write that, and maybe we'll pay you, and maybe we'll publish right, it. Right, right. We, would, we would commission them to write it and work with them on the piece. Right. If someone just sends us a piece and they haven't told us they're writing this or anything, that we're less likely to accept unless they're Tony Cook. <laughs> if someone just writes something because they were interested and, like, went to some artistic director and was like, I'm recording this for American Theater, but really to spec. Like, you don't want to misrepresent the brand to record yeah, something. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, and then come to us and be like, well, we didn't ask you to write this, but if you come to us with a good idea and a well-written pitch that has an like, interesting idea and angle, and you have a unique perspective on it, then we will assign you to write that. Yeah. And uh, one more uh, sort of uh, contribution to that idea is that American Theater is dedicated to carrying the voice of the artist, not just the yeah, voice right, of the journalist. Yeah. So uh, many times, people who are uh, known artists yeah. uh, uh, come to us and say, I want to write about this or talk right. about that's this. That's certainly true with the anthology. I mean, I'd say oh, yeah. the majority of pieces in there, or at least 50% of them, yeah. are by artists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Well, you know, I will say also that we, we don't say uh, uh, pieces on spec so much, but people give speeches. Richard Nelson, that, that, sure. was a, that was a speech, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. That, that, that. We seek out, if someone's someone interesting we know about is giving a speech somewhere, we want to get a transcript of the speech. That, that, that'll happen. Or, or they'll just send us their speech and we'll say, well, let's talk about it. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll write that. So that does, that's one source of copy for us. One more questions? You know, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm Kirsten from Arena Stage. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, to me, this is really interesting. I have a question about um, since you are, or since you have moved online, and, and you have been covering more news content that's yeah. happening, you know, as you were getting it. Yeah. Um, so we saw the season announcement coverage and that sort of thing happening too. Yeah. So, what are you are you considering also just news pieces? Like, are there there new things of interest that you're looking to cover in that daily content that we should be thinking about um, as we? Forward and sharing releases. What things might strike you beyond the season announcements? Yeah, I. The season announcements feels to me timely. Like what, and, and kind of core mission to me is, uh, what are you putting on your stage? We're going to list that. That that seems that seems key. Uh, As our key, uh, key yeah, hirings, hirings, and, and firings. We're talking yeah, about yeah. the. Leaving. Interest is an exit. And then, and then, and, and, and in memoriam. I mean, those are things that we've always done in our front, front of book news. We haven't really done as much thinking, I will admit. We also have been trying to do, we can't cover every new play festival in the world in the magazine, but we've actually been trying to cover as many play festivals and new work festivals with some kind of coverage previews or have someone there for online. That's something we've, we've been doing. We haven't given a lot of thought to other kinds of news, so maybe we can collaborate on that. Uh, uh, you know, we don't tend to do somebody got a giant grant to build a building. We've been trying to figure out, maybe someone else can help us with, when do we report a new building? When they announce they're going to do it, when they break ground, when they say they're going to start a fundraising camp capital campaign, when the place opens that we can take a photo. I don't, I'm, when they rip, cut a ribbon, I, I don't know, sure. Because we're not going to announce it every darn time. Right? Yeah, we, like, we, we don't tend time. to do those kinds of things that get lots of local press. We don't do anniversaries as such because yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. All the time. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so we, we don't do anniversaries as such. Like an anniversary is a time when publicists will pitch us things and we'll say we're not going to cover that is the 50th, but let's talk about other things we could, you know, another angle and maybe it won't be right on time for your anniversary. So Rock, the Rock Shulker thing came about because they were pitching him 
Is it their 40th? Is 40th there? I said, well, Our Emily we missed that by a couple of days. It's going to couple mark years. her 25th year at the, uh, at the McCarter, but that's not what the story yeah. is about. So I don't know, just, that's just an example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hope that helps. There'll be more of that you guys can talk about. When's your session with DPC? Yeah, we have a session tomorrow during lunch, which is we'll take feedback on both coverage in the magazine and specifically on the website and more of what you want to see us cover. I think another part of your question was, are we doing more of exclusive online-only stories other than just the season announcements and issues? And we totally are. Yeah, we're doing a lot of that. We're doing, we are doing a lot of previews. But I guess we mm -hmm. got to finish about news. <coughs> we're doing a lot of it. just shows that we can't fit into the magazine. Yeah, I mean, our, our lead time for print is so long, mm -hmm. as you know if you've ever tried to get a story placed, mm -hmm. that it's we just have, six we weeks have to, we have to miss a lot of stuff. And so we, now with yeah. online, we said, you know what, we can do a story. Do it in a matter of an hour, hour. hour, so it's completely it's much different. different ball game. Right, so. But also in terms of news, we can't like write up every time a new show is cast for every theater. Right, yeah, no, no. We're, so like season and out. We we'll do it less news than Playbill and uh, uh, Broadway.com or what are they, all the different, or Broadway World, whatever it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Other questions? If you don't have any questions, Jim's going to be signing this, this wonderful is a book. Great, this is 25 a great book. years of great. Aware of this book. This, is the, this came out how many years ago, Terry? I don't know. Four, six four, years five, ago. Six years ago. Uh, yeah. Oh no, the 25th anniversary of the magazine. Six years ago. Six years ago. We're now in our 31st year. But uh, this is a, a, a virtual you know, history of the regional theater movement through the documents uh, that, that I'm not just saying it's favorite. It's not just a. It's not just a history. There's also amazing manifestos and screeds and rants, and it's just it's great. Mm -hmm. It's a great piece. It's, it's, it's a great book. It's a it's a terrific book too. So, so. Thanks very much. Yeah.